So let's get started. Um, today we're going to be going over germination and emergence of the seed bank. And um, I'd like to thank one of the other grad students in my lab, Christine Everill, because she actually put this most of this presentation together. I just moved some things around and redid some things. But she is the good germination and emergence queen, actually, when it comes to weeds. So um, are germination and emergence the same thing? What do you guys think? No, that's right. Um, Germination is, over on the left-hand side, it's defined by the emergence of the radical or the primary root from the seed, whereas emergence is when your plant actually emerges from the soil and into the open air. <coughs> so germination begins when a dormant seed becomes active, which basically means that at this point, the seed has become viable for germination and adequate environmental conditions exist in, in the growing area of the seed. So this means that the seed has stopped becoming dormant, hormone levels have changed within the seed, the embryo starts to grow, and the environmental conditions, so say temperature, light, and a bunch of other things that we're going to go over um, are the correct conditions for growing for that seed and that plant. Um, resumption of seed growth basically starts or can be characterized as an initiation of rapid um, metabolic activity. So there's a lot of breakdown of the starches that exist in the seeds. Um, the embryo starts to grow, so you have um, imbibing of water as well to help um, respiration and other metabolic activities occur. And you also then have the emergence of the radical. Okay. Germination also involves a really big role of plant hormones, specifically gibberellic acid and then abcetic acid, or ABA. The two of these kind of play hand in hand, and ABA is really important when it comes to seed dormancy and really stopping of the growth of your shoot and root apical meristems. So ABA really plays a major role in keeping that seed dormant, whereas gibberellic acid plays a role in initiating seed germination and emergence. It stops the initiation of um, ABA. So first here you see we have ABA, which is keeping the seed at its dormant level. Then when conditions occur and environmental conditions get right for germination to start um, happening, GA will become heightened in levels and will inhibit the action of ABA. You can also have ethylene, which is present both in the soil as well as sometimes it can be produced by seeds. And this also acts on ABA to inhibit its effects. So then you have germination of the seed. And then factors such as seed size, the depth of where the seed is in the soil profile, different characteristics of your soil, so say aeration, you know, oxygen content, nitrogen, light availability, that sort of thing has also an effect. You can also have stress such as pathogens or different insects that might occur or lack of nutrients that would be a problem um, in preventing the seed from actually emerging. Yeah. Uh -huh. ABA inhibits germination. It stops the growth of your shoot apical meristem and your root apical meristem within the embryo of the seed, whereas gibberellic acid, or GA, is a germination promoter. Any other questions before we move on? And, and GA works by inhibiting the ABA? Uh-huh, yep. It also works by um, promoting the breakdown of the different starches within the endosperm of your seed. So once the breakdown of those starches begin, they can be then be used for respiration and used for metabolic activities. Okay. Then after you've had germination, your next step, of course, is emergence. And there's three different types of emergence. First, you can have hypogeal, where your cotyledon, or your primary leaf, remains underneath the soil surface. This is very common in the grasses, as we were seeing last week, as well as Fabiaceae families, so any legumes and peas and stuff like that. So generally, what will happen is that you can see here that this could be your um, cotyledon or your primary leaf. And this basically would be the soil line right here. You then have your emergence of your coleoptile, which is your primary, your first um, 
it's not the primary leaf, but it's the first shoot um, apical meristem, or basically first leaf structure that is going to appear out of the soil. And from the coleoptile, you'll then have the primary leaf, which is develops right here. And just know that in Poaceae specifically, the oldest part of the plant is at the tip, and the newest part is at the base of the soil or the growing meristem part. So how do you guys think that hybogeal growth would be beneficial for these types of weeds? Anybody? Soil. Yep, that is a possibility. What also might be a benefit of having the coleoptile underneath the soil? So your coleoptile, remember, is your um, primary leaf structure, or your, your basically your first shoot meristem. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep, it's going to help definitely with um, different herbicides. So say contact herbicides might not be as effective because you still have your main growing point underneath the soil. Also, it can help from, yeah, like freezing. It can also help from, um, say, mowing or other type of management practices that just happen right on the soil, or the, the surface of the soil rather than actually being systemic and going through the soil. Okay, we also next have epigeal growth, which basically means that the cotyledon emerges from the soil. So you'll have first the radical, which develops here underneath. You'll then have the cotyledon emerge from the soil along with the seed. And from the seed, you'll have the two cotyledons develop. The seed will then fall off, and you have your coleoptile, which is still above ground. Most of the dicots. Um, are there any dicots that are like epigeal? Epigeal? Or are you talking about the hypogeal? Some Fabiaceae are epigeal, and then other Fabiaceae are hypogeal. Specifically, peas are hypogeal, even though they're from the Fabiaceae family. So that is one way that they can grow. <coughs> You also can have what's called hostorial cotyledons, which are very common in black swallowwort, which um, basically means that you have parts that are both above and below ground, which can make it pretty difficult when you're trying to control for these plants. Okay, you also have a bunch of different germination um, techniques or timing of germination and when that would occur. Um, the first type is quasi-simultaneous, which means that with these species, most of the seeds are all going to germinate at the same time. So you can have seeds that would germinate, say, specifically in the early summer, or say midsummer, or late in the fall, and they're all going to germinate at that one specific time. Um, a really good example of this is Plantago major, or a broad broadleaf plantain. That is a really good example of um, a summer. Um, emerging plant or germinating plant. You can also have continuous where the seeds would start germinating say in late May and then they'll continue germinating throughout the summer and not stop until temperatures start to get colder in the fall. A good example of this is Poa annua or annual bluegrass as we saw last week in lab. And then we have periodicity which basically means that there can be short bursts of germination depending upon um, certain times of the year or different conditions of, you know, in different environmental conditions and stuff like that. You can have wild oats, for example, which you can have cohorts of seeds where one group will germinate early in the spring and then the second cohort would germinate late in the fall. So here are some examples. This graph is really nice because it kind of gives an example of how the three different types of germination can occur in terms of timing. Here we have periodicity with wild oat where you have this one big huge group that germinates early in the spring and then a second one that germinates late in the fall. So right about right now. You can have continuous which is shepherd's purse or Capsella bursa uh, pastoris which it basically starts in the early spring and will be continuous throughout the entire growing season. Then we have the quasi-simultaneous where there's a big spurt here in the mid or beginning of summer, but then it kind of fades off to the end. Stephanie, is the, is the cohort the second? Uh-huh. 
Yeah, so in Wild Oat here, you're gonna, this is your first cohort, or, and then the second group over here would be a second cohort. So they're part of two different, um, not necessarily like families of seeds or just group of seeds. So you have one group that would germinate early in the spring, and then a second group that would germinate in the fall. And that second cohort is basically all those seeds are the same age, so most probably they're seeds that were produced by the first cohort early in the season. Does that make sense to everybody? Cool. Okay. This can be really important in timing of emergence and timing of germination when it comes to the planting of your crop and how you also you're going to manage your soil and manage your um, weeds throughout the season. So here, examples, we have a bunch of different groups of common weeds that would be germinating at different times as compared to when you're planting your crop. So weeds that would be occurring before you, before you start planting your crop here would be groups one and two or even zero if they happened early in the previous fall. So a big example is quackgrass and wild oats as well and some dandelion and lamb's quarters. At the same time as your crop is being planted, you have other things such as giant foxtail, some cockleburr, um, as well as barnyard grass that are all going to come up at the same time. And then you have ones that you need to control for after your crop has emerged or after your crop has been planted. So you need to start thinking about crabgrass, which grass in different in fall panicum and other things like that. Okay. Let's move on to a safe site concept. So this is basically um, just an example of looking at environmental conditions and how um, environmental conditions can create areas of where it would be favorable for germination and emergence. So first off, you have dormancy breaking stimuli. This can be things such as um, the temperature is correct, you've had, say, a, either a cold period or you've had a warm period, which will allow the seed to germinate. You have enough light, which is necessary for um, the seed to capture in order to initiate growth. And you also can have things such as the chemicals that might be within the soil that they might imbibe when they're imbibing water, or you might have, say, something like scarification, which is the mechanical breaking of the seed coat, which then allows the seed to imbibe water or other nutrients and stuff like that. You have, like I said, environmental conditions, so things like light, temperature, moisture, which are favorable, as well as different resources for growth. So when all of these conditions are favorable for the seed, that is what you would call a safe site for the seed to grow. You also then have absence of hazards, such as different insects or diseases that might be affecting the seed, and you have physical placement or a physical gap. So this refers to the orientation of the seed within the soil, as well as where the seed is in terms of its neighbors and if it has actual room for it to grow. Um, you can also have, as we saw last week in lab, specialized seed structures. So with the example of the wild oat, we had the awns, which when it came in contact with water, as a lot of you guys saw, it started spinning and orienting the seed to go down into the soil. Did everybody see that in lab, or were most of you guys able to witness that? It was pretty cool. Okay, so this is a study that kind of looked at um, relating back to seed orientation and how that's important. Um, and it looked at dandelion or Taraxacum officinale as well as annual sow thistle or Sonchus aurelicaceus. And basically what they did here was they had several different um, orientation patterns on the soil. Some of them were laid on top of the soil, others were buried underneath. And then they changed the orientation of where the seed was located. So was it upright or was it upside down? Was it on its side? That sort of thing. And as you can see, then they looked at the percentage of germination or how good was the success rate of these seeds germinating. And as you can see, the best situations were when it was planted, at least for dandelion, on it, when it was planted either on its side at the soil surface or when it was planted basically completely upright. So you had an upright orientation of the seed planted at the middle of the um, soil level. 
places where it didn't work too terribly well was when it was placed upside down. So you had, say, the crown was facing upwards instead of into the soil. And other times also it didn't do so great when it just was buried pretty deep underneath the soil. Same kind of thing happened here with the annual south thistle. It did really well when it was planted either on its side or at an angle on top of the soil. Or if it was exactly for this situation, if it was planted deep. But if you had an opposite orientation of your plant, that caused problems. So this kind of gets into the idea of depth of burial. So the best emergence when seeds are shallowly planted, which we saw just with that study. If you plant them too deep into the soil, they aren't going to receive enough light or oxygen and other soil properties that are going to help them actually to emerge and to germinate. Um, a lot of, as we were saying, species can be light sensitive, which we'll get into in a moment when it comes to phytochrome levels in terms of far red and a red light. And the depth of, if you do have all of your requirements met, so say if you have enough light, you have moisture, the content which is good, and your temperatures are all correct, it really isn't going to matter where the depth is. It only matters when the seed is too deep in the soil and the other requirements that are necessary for growth are not being met. So that kind of relates back to the safe site concept. Although emergence is highly correlated with depth. So you might have germination of your seed at say 10 centimeters within the soil because all of the requirements are there, but you might have difficulty with the seed actually emerging from the soil if it's too deep. So this is an example of the percentage of emergence. So we're looking here, these, each of these three weed species were planted at different depths. So starting at zero and then moving forward into different meters, as well as different temperatures as well as they were looking at here. And you can see that most of them did quite well when they were planted at the, I believe it's in inches, so at a half inch here whereas they did quite poorly when it was planted at four inches deep within the soil. Also, you had a pretty good, um, the temperature also played a role, or the temperature of the soil. So they are much happier when the soil is between 60 to 80 degrees Fahrenheit, but if the soil gets too hot, which was here in the other study, 80 to 95 degrees, they weren't too happy. So the first step of germination, or to initiate, um, the, to initiate um, embryonal growth within the seed, and to initiate seed to actually stop from being dormant, one of the major things is that you need to have the imbibing of moisture. This is an example of a dormant seed here on the left, and then this is when it's absorbed all that water. It's going to help it expand its size, allow the seed to have room to actually start growing with the embryo, and also helps promote the breakdown of the starch and initiation of, you know, gibberellic acid to continue that breakdown. This is an example of a study that looked specifically at moisture content within the seeds at different relative humidities, and also looked at um, scarifying seeds, so the mechanical breakage of the seed coat, which is oftentimes necessary for some species to even be able to imbibe water. So here what they did was they had the seeds stored for different lengths of time, and they then changed the relative humidity or moved them into different greenhouse storing tanks um, at, for different points in time. And you can see at the beginning here there was a relative, the relative moisture content was pretty high when they started, but as the days increase and as time goes along, you'll see that the hard seeds have a much harder time of continuing to keep that moisture content after they've been moved back and forth into areas of different relative humidity. This is because that seed coat is too thick for the seed to actually imbibe water and to maintain that moisture content, whereas the scarified seeds have a much easier time of when they're moved from a 30% relative humidity back to the 70%, despite whatever long time that it's gone from being scarified, it still is able to imbibe water. Does that make sense to everybody, pretty much? Or keep that moisture content pretty good. 
Okay, let's move on to temperature. So what do you guys have to think about temperature? What do you guys, why do you think temperature might be important? Anybody? Sure. Speed of the rate of reaction. Yep, exactly. If you don't have a temperature that is too cold or if you have a temperature that's too hot, enzymes are not going to be working properly. It's not going to be breaking down starch or promoting growth in the processes that you would want your seed to be doing so. So there's definitely a minimum and a maximum as well as an optimum temperature growth requirements for each species. Um, you can also have alternating temperature requirements. So you have um, a fluctuation within the day, of course. The temperatures that are colder in the morning, you know, you get to your high temperature throughout the day, and then it goes back to cold in the night. That also is going to have an effect on when your, ger your seed germinates and emerges, as well as whether or not those optimum temperatures are actually being reached throughout the day. So this study kind of looked at um, the depth of the soil and different seeds and uh, it also looked at the temperature of how temperature changes within the soil. So here we were looking at, they took several different measurements throughout the, the day, starting with 6 o'clock in the morning, then 8, noon, and then later on in the afternoon. And you can see here that there is the least amount of change in the soil temperature between the early morning, so between about 6 and 8 o'clock. It doesn't really change that much no matter what your depth of soil is going to be. Whereas, say at noon, you have a much higher temperature of soils at your soil surface, of course because the sun's out, but your temperatures are going to get much colder as you move further down into the soil. It makes pretty much good sense. You also have, as we were saying, the minimum or low temperature requirement, which sometimes can occur at or below freezing. And this is going to be important with whether or not your seed is going to remain dormant or if it is actually going to become viable. Because seeds sometimes, if they've become viable and have started to imbibe water and started to germinate, if, your soil go, or if the soil temperature goes below freezing or at freezing, you can actually freeze your seed. Another requirement for germination and for emergence is the intensity or the amount of absolute light that is required for your seed to grow. This is just a basic list of plants that do require light in order to germinate and to emerge. Some of them don't require light, but others do. So I believe this is in your packet, and if not, I can get it to you guys. You also need a specific amount of photo period. As you guys all know from botany and from plant phys, there's a specific you know, short day plants or long day plants. So the amount and length of daylight that you would have. And oftentimes you can sometimes either break dormancy or break emergence and that sort of thing with changing the amount of photo period that you would have. The spectral composition or the quality of light that you have supplying to your seeds is also very important, when, especially when it comes to red and far red light, which are involved with the photoreceptors and um, different elements of your seed. So specifically looking at red light and far red light, how many of you guys remember this from botany and from plant phys when it comes to radiation of sunlight and the type of light that is captured during photosynthesis? How many people? Very few. Okay. So in all light that comes from the sun, you have an equal amount of red light and far red light. Um, and red light normally induces growth and induces and promotes um, emergence and germination of your seed, whereas far red light is going to inhibit germination. It's going to prevent it from happening. A lot of times what happens is when the sunlight goes through a leaf of a plant, the plant is going to absorb as much red light as possible, and some light is still going to pass through that leaf. Most of the, leaf, red, or most of the light that's going to be transmitted is going to be far red light, and a very small amount of the red light is going to be transmitted. Red light is a very important when it comes to photosynthesis and is much more favorable quality of light in terms of the light spectrum for plants to be using instead of far red light. Does that kind of make sense to everyone? Okay. So at full sun, 
you have just a bit greater amount of red light than you do far red light. So the ratio of red to far red is normally about 1.2. And then the type of canopy that you have, so the composition of your plants that you have in terms of what types of leaves they have, so if they're broad leaves or if they're narrow leafed plants or say grass, grassy leaf plants, that's going to affect the red to far red ratio that you have that's reaching your soil. So these are just some basic examples of the type of leaf canopies that you can have. You can have basically if you get to a shaded bare ground, you can have about a 0.85 ratio. Whereas you're, if you're working with a very wide leaf plant such as tobacco or Nicotiana tobacco, tobacco, where you have two layers of leaves, your ratio is gonna go much down or much farther down. So you're gonna have much rest, or a lesser amount of red light as you would to far red light. So phytochrome is the basic pigment that is found in all plant leaves or plant shoot structures that um, has two different forms. You have PR and then PFR. PR is the active form for when it is absorbing red light, and the PR form promotes germination and promotes growth. Whereas when far red light is collected by your leaf, Phytochrome is going to change its form into PFR, which is the inactive form here, which inhibits growth and inhibits germination. Sometimes when you have an adult plant or you have a seedling, what can happen is if it starts collecting too much far red light, it's going to promote what's called shade avoidance. Or um, basically what's going to happen is it's going to promote the elongation of your inner nodes so your plant is going to grow very spindly and very tall really quickly, but it's not going to accumulate very much biomass. You guys kind of saw that when you were walking through my field, when we were doing the research experiment, and you saw a lot of those plants could, were pretty tall, but they were much thinner than the ones that were out in the areas of only the weeds. Do you guys kind of remember that? A lot of times it happened with both the velvet leaf and with the lamb's quarters. Okay, so this is a graph that basically is just looking at the quality of light at different situations in terms of um, what your cropping rows and what your field might look like. Above the canopy here, you're going to have a lot of light in your spectral. Um, you're going to have much more red light than you would a far red light. As well as sometimes at the ground level in between plant rows, you're going to have a lot more red light than you would far red. But when, when it gets to at the ground level and you're looking within the rows, so you're looking at the ground surface underneath the canopy of your crop or of your weeds, this is just an example showing that, of course, there's much more far red light than there is red light. Makes sense since the canopy is absorbing all of that red light. Okay. This experiment here looked at a bunch of different weed species. And then they grew them at our, planted the seeds and tried to see how many would germinate at different growing situations. So they put them into um, areas with a lot of light. Then they shaded them with or prevented light from being shown. Of course, you would think that sometimes that the germination would then not be so much. And then they then shaded them with banana leaves. Banana leaves, as you guys know, are pretty big. They're pretty wide as well. Um, and then they also shaded them with some paper or just a neutral paper source. So, you know, just using some printer paper. All of these treatments got light to start with. So, um, and then they were then put into the different treatments here with the dark, the banana leaf, or the other leaves too. And you can see how different each of the species are in terms of their percentage germination based upon what is the different treatments. So what are you guys seeing here? Anybody? What does it look, what does the pattern seem to be showing? Or what can we see from some of these? Taking a look maybe at the light treatment and then looking at the germination rates here in the banana leaf. Most don't uh, germinate in dark or very shaded conditions. Yeah. Why do you think that would be? Not favorable. 
Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What about in relation to, say, red light and far light, or far red light quality? How do you think that might change? Question, sorry? They're getting more far red light? Yep. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Okay. This is actually kind of going over the same thing. I think we've bashed this concept into the ground, but I think you guys all kind of understand that differences in far red to red light as you move closer to the ground and as you move through the canopy. Does that make sense to everybody? Great. <coughs> okay, what happens if you don't have any light? As we kind of saw in that experiment just a moment ago. Because we all know that light is required for most species or many species to germinate. What do you guys think would happen? Yeah, exactly. You can also, um, if for species that do require light, sometimes night t cultivation or night tillage might be helpful. Um, there have been experiments that have looked at different sizes of seeds and different weed species and how effective this is. And sometimes farmers will go out, say if it's really cloudy during the day, or they might actually go right out at night and if there's not en you know, enough moonlight. Um, I think, and I have to double check on this, but I think what they found was that weed seeds that are smaller in size are um, much more susceptible to night tillage. So if you bring them up to the soil surface, let them desiccate, they won't, they won't germinate. Whereas larger size seeds, so say velvet leaf or I believe barnyard grass, um, they were still able to germinate when you still brought them up to the soil surface. So I'll look on that and I'll send you guys the paper because I have it and I just didn't have time to put it in there. Um, so like we were saying, reduction of smaller weed seeds when it comes to night tillage. So good examples are lamb's quarters, pigweed, ragweed, and black nightshade. Okay, moving on to oxygen. So all plants require oxygen in small amounts, at least to germinate. Why do you guys think this might be? Think maybe back to Bio 101 or Bio 109 when it comes to respiration. Yeah. They use the oxygen for getting the, and the energy before they have sunlight available for, for emergence. For yeah, exactly. So. Most species, the, vari the amount varies, but they need between about 21 to 50 percent <laughs> oxygen within the soil. We're getting there, guys. Don't you worry. It might be a little boring, but we're getting through it. <laughs> okay. The higher amount of O2 that you have within your soil, the increased amount of germination you're going to have. Makes sense. Okay. And as we all know, some soils can vary between their oxygen and their carbon dioxide content. Yep. Um, this could be, I believe, with very well aerated soils, like really so sandy soils. The air in the atmosphere is only 20% oxygen, or 21%. That's a good question. I'll have to ask Tony on that. Because I thought in soils you usually get about 10% oxygen in, in, in a well aerated soil. You know what? I will check on that because I'm not really too sure. So, good for bringing that up. <laughs> Okay, so what affects soil aeration and those O2 levels if we think that they might not be as high as we would like them to be? How can we change that? What can we do to aerate our soils? Tillage. Tillage. That's a good one. What else can we do? If you have really clay soils, you can amend that by adding more organic matter or adding more sand to your soil. Like we said, cultivation is really, really good. If you have really wet soils, that might be a problem. So if you want to increase aeration, things that you would want to do are cultivation and, of course, adding <laughs> sand. And soils that have a decreased amount of aeration are really clayey soils or waterlogged soils. OK. Some other inhibitors and stimulators include, uh, include nitrate, which also promotes germination. Makes sense. All plants need nitrogen. 
You can have root exudates. So you can, these can either promote germination or they can inhibit germination. Um, a good example, do you guys know about, um, well, which weed is a really good example. They host a lot of root exudates um, and they need those exudates in order to germinate. Do you guys know the story with um, black walnut? That they exudate, they're really bad. Yeah, they exudate um, juglins or, um, I can't exactly remember what the chemical is called, but um, it's related to black walnut and the root exudates that those give off promote or prevent any other species within a big huge area. It's like I think three feet area or something, three meters or more um, from anything else germinating. And a weed that we will learn in class, Tree of Heaven, also does the same thing. And seedling density, as we all know, is really important. Okay, as we talked earlier, when it comes to scarification, seed coats and the compounds that are within those seed coats um, are going to prevent germination or promote germination. And sometimes these compounds that are within the seed coat need to be eroded or taken away or leached away so that germination can occur. Um, this experiment right here is just looking at lamb's quarters, which has um, different chemicals on its seed coat, and the length of time that they, the seeds were washed for and the percentage of germination. So the longer that these seeds were washed, the higher the rate of germination we had. Okay, so then taking temperature, nitrate, and light into consideration, um, different treatments were created here with different amounts of temperatures, water content, as well as different levels of nitrate that were added. And as you guys can all see, after five days, depending upon whether or not nitrate was added and as the temperature increased, you can see that um, germination rates were much higher. Okay, and one last thing that we can get through here is just in terms of emergence timing, some species need a really long time as we were talking about when it comes to continuous emergence or continuous germination, um, as well as periodicity of germination and periodicity of emergence. You can have ones that take quite a long time. So giant foxtail, I personally have seen this because of my experiment. They are normally the last seeds that I would plant out there that would emerge from the soil. They generally, as you can see, can, if you planted them on May 15th, this experiment saw that at least two to almost three weeks later, that's when you finally reached most of your germination of your seeds. Whereas when it comes to things like velvet leaf, early on you have, um, well actually, about two weeks later you still have um, only 50% germination as well. Um, this can also occur or be important for when you are managing your soils. So if you have, um, if you plant your soybeans later than you normally would and control early on for weeds that would be occurring, you can have a really great reduction of the, your seeds because of that delaying in the emergence. Does that make sense to everybody? Cool. This was pretty quick. It was pretty windward or fast presentation of emergence and germination. Does anybody have any questions?